In the last crit pits, we spoke about hypovolemic shock. That is when you have a primary decrease in the tank or the intravascular volume, and the compensation is to increase the pump, the heart rate and the stroke volume, and to increase the venous and arterial tone to maintain good perfusion. In this crit pits, we're gonna talk about obstructive shock. In obstructive shock, you still have a decrease in the intravascular volume, but it's a relative decrease, and I'll get into that in just a little bit. But as compensation for that, we have an increase in our pump, our heart rate, and our stroke volume to compensate for that decline in the intravascular volume, and we have an increase in our arterial tone to maintain good perfusion to the distal tissues. With obstructive shock, it's a relative decrease in the intravascular volume. Now the body doesn't lose intravascular volume, but there's a problem of getting the intravascular volume into the heart or through the heart. So if you imagine the heart as a continuous pump, we have trouble getting blood into the heart, we have trouble getting blood through the heart, and we have trouble getting blood out of the heart. As long as you understand this model, you understand obstructive shock. There's a few different types of obstructive shock. The first one is tamponade. Pericardial tamponade is when you have fluid building up in the pericardial space such that it pushes down on the right ventricle and doesn't allow that right ventricle to fill. And if blood doesn't get to the right ventricle, then blood can't get to the left ventricle. And if blood can't get to the left ventricle, then we have no cardiac output and we have shock. Tamponade can come from a variety of causes. It can come from penetrating trauma. It can come from free ventricular rupture, post-MI. It can come from uremic pericarditis. And it can come from infectious causes of the pericardium, including viral, bacterial, and really any infection that affects the pericardial space. The classic finding of tamponade is JVD, distant heart sounds, and hypotension. While this is an important thing to remember for the examination, just remember that all three of these things together rarely ever present, except when the patient is in obvious extremis and is about to die. Usually you'll only see one or two of these things. So don't wait for these physical findings to make the diagnosis. What you need to do is use ultrasound. The next type of obstructive shock is caused by constrictive pericarditis. And what happens here is that pericardium is tight around the heart and doesn't relax and allow filling of the right ventricle. And so what happens is effectively it's like tamponade where that RV can't relax and blood can't get through the heart to the other side. The way to fix this is with pericardial stripping. The way you diagnose it is with ultrasound, but that's a little bit beyond this crit bits for today. The next type of obstructive shock is tension pneumothorax. This can happen spontaneously after penetrating trauma or even blunt. It can happen iatrogenically if someone isn't using ultrasound during their central lines. And what happens in this case is there's a puncture to the lung and this lung now collapses and air is now filling up this space. This mediastinum is gonna get shifted over and this is going to kink the great vessels, specifically the SVC. And this is going to decrease filling to the right heart. And if the RV can't fill, then the LV can't fill. Also what happens is there's a little bit of a tamponade effect because all that air is going to push down on that heart and by squishing it down, it's going to decrease the filling of the left side also. So there's a dual effect on this heart. Decreased filling and it gets squished down so it can't relax and fill with blood. Now the way you're gonna diagnose this, as per the textbook, is you're gonna look for a deviated trachea, a hyperpercussive chest, decreased breath sounds, but I'm gonna tell you, none of those things are very reliable. Rely on ultrasound to make the diagnosis very, very quickly. And if you have the diagnosis, you need to first needle decompress them do a finger thoracostomy, or place a chest tube very, very quickly because this person is apt to die. The next type of obstructive shock is a tension hemo or hydrothorax. This doesn't happen commonly, but it can affect the heart and the great vessels just like a tension pneumothorax did, so it's just here for completion. Just realize that that thoracic space can get filled up so much that it pushes over into the other side of the thorax, compressing the great vessels and decreasing filling of the heart. Number five is a massive PE. If a big blood clot goes from the lower extremities and lodges itself in the main pulmonary artery or in one of the branches such that there is an obstruction to right ventricular flow, this is going to lead to a decreased filling of the left ventricle. These patients need immediate thrombolysis 
If this obstructive clot is not quickly dealt with, the RV is not going to be able to handle that pressure overload and is going to go into failure. The next cause of obstructive shock is SVC syndrome, superior vena cava syndrome, which can happen as a primary or metastatic disease from cancer. The SVC can't dump blood into the right atrium and the right ventricle. And this is because there's a cancer burden that is obstructing flow, whether extrinsically or intrinsically to that vessel. Patients will have plethora of their face, their neck, their upper extremities, and this is an emergency when these patients present. The next cause of obstructive shock is abdominal compartment syndrome. Abdominal compartment syndrome occurs when there is edema of the bowels or a massive amount of intra-abdominal fluid. This can come from things like pancreatitis, bowel infarction, and dead gut, and also just from over-resuscitation with fluids. The problem here is there's so much pressure in the abdominal compartment that this pushes on the IVC, and this decreases venous return back to the heart. This is kind of like SVC syndrome, where there's a compression of the vessel such that blood can't get into the heart. Well, this is just happening from underneath in the IVC. These patients need the underlying problem reversed and possibly have their abdomens open to relieve the obstruction and allow blood flow to go back to the heart. And finally, the last cause of obstructive shock, which is sometimes categorized in cardiogenic shock on the next grip bit, is valvular stenosis. Things like tricuspid stenosis, pulmonic stenosis, mitral stenosis, and aortic stenosis all cause a restriction of flow throughout the heart, and this causes a decrease in cardiac output. Now I said these are technically part of cardiogenic shock because it's secondary to the heart, but some people classify this as obstructive shock, just as I do, because it fits the mold that there is an obstruction of flow into and out of the heart. So I think it fits here. These patients might benefit from surgery or balloon valvuloplasty, neither of which we're doing in the ICU, but this is a good idea to keep in mind so you know the right people to call. So we went through a lot. Just remember that obstructive shock is any situation where you have a problem getting blood in like SVC syndrome, getting blood into the right ventricle, like tension pneumothorax or pericardial tamponade, problems getting blood through the heart, such as any of these valvular lesions, or pulmonary embolism. And remember, the fastest, simplest, and most non-invasive way to diagnose all of these things are, you guessed it, ultrasound. So learn how to do these tests so you can rapidly diagnose this type of shock.